Welcome to episode, what is this, 67? 67, in class with Dr. Gray Carr. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all around the world, large Africana studies classroom in the world. Thank you. Hi, love you. Good morning. Okay. We replace I with we, we change illness to wellness. I love that shirt. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sunyata, for, for reminding us of the words of the great um, Malcolm X, and you got all of the greats there, Carter G. Woodson, Sterling Brown. These are my people from uh, from Dunbar High School in D.C., the great Dunbar. So um, Nubia Garima and all her uh, co-teachers, and it's graduation season around this time. So shout out to all the graduates of high school coming out, and particularly my youngsters at the Dunbar, Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, the famous right here in, in Northwest D.C., right down the street from um, where I suppose we're now gonna be celebrating Juneteenth because uh, the President of the United States signed a bill. All so, right, uh, before we get into that, at some point we have to do Dunbar High School as a you should know. Absolutely. In narrative because it, it, as much as it is an example of excellence, it also is an example of what happens when you get complacent. Yeah, well, you don't understand the implications of how, well, we, no one could have predicted what integration would and wouldn't do. And there were class tensions as well. For those of you who are on the narrative side, uh, you, you no doubt recall from part two of our discussion of John Brown, there's a direct link between uh, the Africans who gave their lives at Harper's Ferry to liberate us and Dunbar High School. One of the, one of the uh, widows of one of the brothers that died at Harper's Ferry ended up in Washington, D.C. And so, uh, but at the same time, what does it mean for us to produce this excellence and that excellence then to be eroded in part because of assumptions we made about what may or may not happen after the end of desegregation. And Dunbar is a microcosm, not just Dunbar in uh, D.C., Dunbar in Baltimore, Dunbar in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. We talked about Paul Lawrence Dunbar in Little Rock, Arkansas. If y'all remember way back when we were talking about the so-called Little Rock Nine, the idea that Black folk in this country have been narrated by memory as sacrificial lambs for the advancement of the settler state. So when you see the Little Rock Nine, uh, you rarely hear. And we talked, remember we talked about that with David Bates, The Long Shadow of Little Rock. You know, those young people, some of them were graduates, oh, not graduates, they were uh, they were high school students at the segregated schools before, Mifflin Gibbs, uh, and then they opened a new Horace Mann School, the Horace Mann School, uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar had been there. And so, you know, I don't like to say black excellence because I think that that carries with it in this moment right. a certain sheen of performance of excellence. Well, right. also a juxtaposition to, right. like, as if it's something different, you right. know. How about it's foundational excellence? Mm -hmm. How about it's original excellence? How that's about exactly, you know, like exactly. if we're gonna go there, and then we should do it that way. That's exactly right. So yeah, we we should definitely do. But yeah, all of these and so many more um, are graduates of Dunbar or on the faculty at Dunbar, like Carter Woodson, you know, Sterling Brown, and, and Charles Hampton Houston, a Dunbar graduate, Charles Drew, you know, Dunbar graduate, and so 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 many others. But I mean, again, that's what we do when we uh, when we do what we need to do. And right. That, but that, and, and this demise is also an example of what happens when we forget who we are. Oh, sure. Sure. Which is another reason why I support these young people and the young teachers there, because they have a saying every day at Dunbar, they are determined to reconnect to that memory because Dunbar still exists. And those young people are very much aware that they are heirs to a great legacy and they uh, work every day to extend that legacy. So shout out to the Carter G. Woodson uh, Academy of Black Studies at Paul Lawrence Dunbar, because that is indeed a formal learning community at Dunbar. So my young sister Nubia and her, her comrades and, and all the students, they're not, gonna, they're not going backward. That's right. They, well, they're going backward to get it so they can go forward. It's saying Kofi, it's definitely saying Kofi. You better, you better say it. All right, so last year, uh around this time we had a conversation we actually had two conversations yes. one was a breakdown of what is juneteenth because you know we, we talked about i didn't grow up with it as a holiday uh growing up in east Orange, new jersey didn't even know about it until i was you know an adult and so y'all can go back and see that episode i think it's episode 13. oh wow yes right? that's amazing. how far back it was right you did an extensive thing yeah. on it. yes and then we did episode 14 
do we need a holiday? Yes. Because it was, you know, hmm. rumblings that this was going to, you know. Well, and yeah, I, they introduced the bill a year ago. Shout, yeah. out, shout out to Ron Johnson, white nationalist, uh, the last dog to die, who finally <laughs> lifted his hold. But not that if, if he hadn't lifted his hold, it would have been signed into law a year ago, given who was in uh, the, 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 the executive branch. But uh, Johnson lifted his hold, because you know in the United States Senate, one senator who can remain anonymous can just say no. And this one was Ron Johnson, uh, the soon to be retired senator from Wisconsin. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a year ago we did. We talked. We 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 raised that question, and a lot of people are raising that question right now. Although yeah. it's, it's important to say what we just said, however, because let's just clear this up from the onset. President Hunter and I want y'all to know this was not a rushed bill. Hurry up, give them something because we can't pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act or the For the People Act. So that's an urban legend. Let's just stop. This was introduced last year. <laughs> you understand? So let's just go dispatch with that. But this doesn't erase the question you're raising, which do we need a holiday? And and last year I said um, no, mm -hmm. because just because of what I know is happening now, yes. white folks get a day off. Pe the the ancestors, the descendants of people who enslaved, and they are not all white people had uh, ancestors that enslaved black people. Blah blah blah. But mm -hmm. you benefit from it, and now you get to take a day off and have holiday sales and go out and, and have a day off. I'm like, um, Crazy, uh, hello, it? listen, y'all don't want to pat, y'all don't want us to talk about critical race theory in school. You don't want us to talk about actual history, but you want a holiday to celebrate the last people that were freed from this evil criminal enterprise called slavery. Right. I, I still, I'm still struggling with it, Dr. Carr. Help me, help me to come oh, to- I can't because that is the essential nature of America. Uh, Sister um, Annette Gordon Reed has been making the tour, and I'm sure she's going to, you know, has been quite busy these last few weeks. Uh, her small book of essays called On Juneteenth just came out. Oh, come on, son. There yeah, you go. Yeah. On Juneteenth. Annette Gordon, it's, it's a, little tiny, a little small book. She is a native Texan and, uh, you know, first rate historian and uh, a lot more sympathetic to the American experiment than I am or will ever be. But uh, certainly a brilliant scholar who, you know, talks about the fact that as a Texan who knew about Juneteenth, who was around people who celebrated Juneteenth, as a Texan who learned the mythology of the Alamo, the mythology of Texas, white Texas, who lived in deeply black Texas, who saw what desegregation did to black teachers and black schools. Her own mother, as teacher said, let me be very honest, as an elder, she told her, you know, as she was grown, you know, I got into teaching to teach black children. Let me be very clear about that. I mean, so those segregated schools produced Annette Gordon Reed, who spent time uh, in uh, First Nations communities, uh, one of the reservations in East Texas. Uh, she was raised near Houston in East Texas, which is very different. In fact, she talks about the fact when people ask, well, how does it like to live in Texas? It's so arid and it's so much sense. You live near the beach. And she said, you know, there's more greenery in the area I'm from. The, the green area where I'm from is larger than New England. So let's be very clear about that. I mean, so she talks about that complexity, but, it, but she comes down to say at the very end of the book, and again, it's a very small book. It's only 130 with the coda, 130, uh, 141 pages, you know, she says um, about the difficulties of Texas. Love does not require taking an uncritical stance toward the object of one's affection. In truth, it often requires the opposite. We can't be a real service to the hopes we have for places and people, ourselves included, without a clear-eyed assessment of their and our strengths and weaknesses that often demands a willingness to be critical, sometimes deeply so. How that is done matters, of course. Striking the right balance can be exceedingly hard. I hope I've achieved the proper equilibrium. It's a brilliant, short, brilliant piece of work. The only thing that I would diverge with her on is the love piece. Why you love it? I mean, you love it because it's familiar. You love it because you were born and raised in it. But ultimately, we can all reach different conclusions. And Juneteenth is an important moment. In fact, uh, uh, you know, we talked about this again. You all go back, look at 13 and 14 because we talked a lot about, we, we won't repeat any of that here except by referring to it for you to go back. 
go back and look at the brother um, Wiggins, William Wiggins, who did a massive two volume dissertation complete with all these interviews. He went through, trekked through the South to interview all these black people about these Emancipation Day uh, proclamations. A fraction of that dissertation was remixed, edited, rewritten into the book, O Freedom, Afro-American Emancipation Celebrations, right? He talks about Juneteenth. I wanna quote something from page 18. He had been then, by then worked his way back East. Because if you remember, uh, Juneteenth is only one of a universe of Emancipation Day celebrations. Um, perhaps the, the, the first one, well, no, we talked about that too, and he doesn't really get into that, but I will mention it. July 5th, during our period of enslavement, remember uh, Fred, Fred Douglas gives his What to the Slaves, the 4th of July speech on the 5th of July. Black people deliberately did not celebrate the 4th. They ain't got to do with me. <laughs> we, we'll, 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 in the North now, as they're fighting in an enslavement. Then, of course, you see uh, a date emerge like September the 22nd. That's the day that in 1862, Lincoln issued the, uh, the preliminary emancipation. So it basically told the South, y'all got three, four months to come back into the Union. If you do, you keep them Africans. But January 1st, if you're not in, we say that they're free, even though it didn't apply to the border states because they were already back in. Um, January 1st becomes Emancipation Day. A lot of places, particularly in the Northeast, New York, uh, places like Maryland, D.C., Philadelphia, that is the origin, one of the origins of the watch night service. And y'all have been to watch night on the last day of the year and you sing and pray in after midnight. That's because black people in the North supporting their enslaved uh, brethren in the South said when that clock strikes, let's, in, let's intensify this conflict of the Civil War. And so there, there are many dates like that. And of course, we talked about one a few weeks ago uh, as the Civil War was wrapping up the 1st of May, 1865. Decoration Day, which has been, of course, the completely remixed, talk about controversy, and turned into Memorial Day, when Africans made sure that the ancestors who had made sacrifices, the ultimate sacrifice, were, were honored in, in Charleston, South Carolina. So when you get to Juneteenth, you have this trajectory of emancipation that has nothing to do with the social structure. It has nothing, in fact, the, this is a direct confrontation with the social structure. So when Wiggins, in his smaller version of his dissertation, O Freedom on page 18, he has gone out to Texas. He would interviewed all these people. He's driven out there, he and his family, his wife and him, they've gone out into to Galveston, they've been in Houston, and, and then they work their way back across the country in all these different states. He gets to, uh, to Georgia and Alabama, and it's May 28th. That's the date they celebrate as Emancipation Day. Now, if you work your way back from June 19th, you can see as the word is get spreading in like Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, the dates fall in May. You see it happen in Juneteenth, but then you see it, some places are August the 1st, August the 4th, August the 8th, different places, depending on where you are. Are you Missouri? Are you in Arkansas? Are you in Oklahoma? It's very interesting, but he's, he's now at this, uh, at this church. And he's talking to two elementary school teachers, Ms. Agnes Hubert and Ms. Lula Bass. This is the thing I love about Black people because we don't need people to interpret Black people. Listen to Black people. So now he's in the governance structure. He's at a celebration, right? And he's at a church talking about the celebration. And Ms. Bass says, we didn't spend too much time with the 4th of July. Ms. Hubert, right. You know, you know, Black women. Ms. Bass, because we didn't care nothing about the, what those white folks day. Ms. Huber says, we didn't start to celebrate it until we got in the city. See, in the country, lots of Juneteenth, really a rural celebration. They kill, you know, they kill, the, they, they do the barbecue all day. They working all week. They, I mean, they getting their thing together. They running the races, baseball, all the stuff we talked about. And here we go, Ms. Bass. Here was Ms. Ms. Lula Bass said, until we got in the city. But you know what has actually happened? The reason they don't celebrate the 28th like they used to, we have become culturalized, like the man just finished speaking of. We've been picking up these other folks' culture. We had our own day, but now everything is their day. There's that tension. Now this lady, remember, and she's lamenting the fact now, this book was published in the early 80s, 1987. It is based on a dissertation that was published even earlier than that. So he's talking to elders who remember enslaved Africans. And they're already lamenting the fact that the roots of the day they celebrate is being lost because young people are like, oh, it's a day to celebrate. No, 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 you gotta remember the purpose. And this, these elders are sitting here, these two old black ladies, and one said, yeah, we didn't mess with the 4th of July. Yeah, that was their day. And then this lady laments. She said, we had our own day. Now everything is their day. 
And so while um, Annette Gordon Reed, Professor Reed is grappling with the meaning of Juneteenth to America and Black America and Texas and these various things, some of us are not trying to speak to the social structure and the governance structure at the same time. These ladies are talking about the governance structure. We developed that Africana studies framework so that however the social structure that we live in, whether it be in the United States or globally, no matter how we interact with it, we can at least have a moment when we have the conversation we're having in that governance framework to inform how we engage. So this isn't an attempt to speak to everybody at once, because if you're trying to do that, you ain't talking to nobody, which leads me to, this is a, this is a rare piece, J. Mason Brewer, who was at, um, can't really see that. That's a little pamphlet he called Juneteenth. It's an early pamphlet. This was actually published. Um, this was published in 1931. Well, actually 1932. And then a little pamphlet excerpt, 1933. Brewer was a folklorist, a scholar, a teacher, professor for many years at Samuel Houston College, Houston Tillerson College now there now. And he has a quote in here. This is, this is a collection of stories. He said, I collected stories because on Juneteenth, Black people would sit around and tell these stories. So it's like a little pamphlet where he's talking about he's collecting these little stories, these little small stories. He says, because they're, 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 they're stories about enslavement, resistance, but they're humorous stories. So you cringe a little bit. You see some of the language. Of it. But, but here's the thing. And this is what I want to raise. J. Mason Brewer says at the beginning of the pamphlet, he says, nobody. Nobody who does not understand a Juneteenth celebration can ever understand the Negro, his songs, or his tales. Which I would expand to say, if you don't understand a Juneteenth celebration, then you don't understand us. Now the question becomes, how many of us understand a Juneteenth celebration, what it, what it symbolizes? And that's where it gets to be interesting, it seems to me. And this is where I think is very interesting. The story of Juneteenth, the story of those Emancipation Day rituals, which as we know, if you go back to 13 and 14, are not exclusive to the United States. They are in the Caribbean, they are in Latin America, they are in Africa, anywhere we find ourselves resisting oppression. In the Western hemisphere, it was chattel enslavement. In Africa, it was colonialism. June 16th, for example, that just passed, Soweto, that's Youth Day in, in South Africa. The Independence Days of the Af All of these are a piece, are of the same piece. So when we think Juneteenth, Annette Gordon-Reed would say, you know, Juneteenth is uniquely American. Yeah, it is. And it's not, sis, because it's about Black self-determination. And therein lies the rub. So let's just use our African studies framework. The story of Juneteenth is not the story of the social structure. The story of Juneteenth is the story of the governance structure. It raises the question, who are African people to each other? Not, what does Juneteenth mean to me? So with all due respect to the President of the United States, with all due respect to all the co companies who are lining up Juneteenth sales as we speak, to all the people, all the corporations that are talking about financial freedom on Juneteenth, with all due respect, this is not about what this means to you. That's the question you should ask after you ask the question John Brewer is telling you, which is, what is it to them? So this, you don't get to define this. This is what these elders are saying. You don't get to define this. Or, or no, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. You get to do whatever you want. We have the responsibility not to allow you to define it for us. We have the responsibility to remember, holidays are rituals of social cohesion. That's why the calendar fight is so important. In other words, when we look at Martin Luther King's birthday, and that's a whole nother category of black rituals that were rituals before anybody else recognized them. In fact, you can almost look, I, I, I was thinking about this the other day. I said, you know, Juneteenth and Juneteenth was and is to borrow from the United States Congress, a phrase that was popularized to the rest of people who didn't know that's how procedure works by Maxine Waters. Juneteenth was reclaiming my time. <laughs> Juneteenth is reclaiming our time. So in these retaining, reclaiming our time rituals, these are rituals that uh, have found their way into the official government calendar, not because that was the objective, 
but because there's no way to avoid the presence of the people out of whom the, out of who those rituals emerge. Everybody knows Juneteenth now because George Floyd was killed and Breonna Taylor was killed. Make no mistake about it. The whole country now, it is a holiday because George Floyd was killed. Because you can draw, and, and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Aubrey, you can draw a line from George Floyd, a graduate of John Henry Jack Yates High School in Houston, and we talked about that in 13 and 14, John Henry Yates, known as Jack Yates, Jack Yates High School, he was one of the four brothers, and, and Annette Gordon-Reed mentions them, who put together their money in 1872, bought what became Emancipation Park, transferred to the city of Houston in 1916, where some of the earliest Juneteenth celebrations were made. But in the wake of that, there was all this talk of a reckoning. Everybody was scared out of their minds a year ago. So now, when you see us reclaim our time, and parenthetically, there's a great new book on Juneteenth that just came out. This was Ed, Edward Cottom out of Texas called Juneteenth. Juneteenth, the story behind the celebration. In fact, you see the Juneteenth flag. You saw it's red, white, and blue. It's got the star of Texas and the explosion. Yeah, you riff on what you have. Let me let me find a better it's State House Press 2021. I'm sorry, it's, it's very, it's very, it's very busy. So you see this. But one of the things he talks about in here, and and uh Cottom is an interesting. He's, he's been called Mr. Civil War Galveston, among other things. Galveston, of course, where you see. There's a lot of myth-making around Juneteenth. And I'm just going to put this in a footnote because we didn't talk about this last year. But it's important to remember, and Annette Gordon-Reed gestures to this too. You're going to watch a lot. You've, you've seen a lot of television today. You've seen a lot of television last week. You know, this marks the day, June 19th, 1865, when Jenner, Major General Gordon Granger uh, on the veranda there in Galveston, Texas, read the famous proclamation, General Order Number 3. Cotton reminds us there's no record of Gordon Granger reading anything. Gordon Granger was beefing with Ulysses S. Grant. Grant replaced Granger within a month of him coming into Texas. In fact, Grant didn't want him to go out there in the first place. The thing that saved Granger was between Grant and Granger was a dude named Phil Sheridan. All these cats went to West Point. They were within years of each other in graduating classes. In fact, the Confederate general that surrendered Texas to Granger was his classmate at West Point. This is a family beef. <laughs> you understand? Anyway, I won't get too deep into that. I'm, I'm raising it to say that it was Granger's lieutenant who probably wrote the order up. And the Black population in Galveston was so small that even if he had stood there and read it, they wouldn't have known uh, because it, the word got spread by troops, including a lot of Black troops. The word got spread by like the brothers who were working on the docks at Galveston. Remember, Galveston is right there on the Gulf, which means they were running ships of enslaved Africans up into there. Gerald Horn writes about this as late as the 1850s. And remember, Mexico is on the border. And let's just tie this in very quickly. The 5th of May, 1862, the Mexican army had defeated the French at the Battle of Puebla. That's why we call it Cinco de Mayo. But Mexico had abolished enslavement. And one of Grant's concerns was, if I don't send a strong general out there to Texas, the French who've been pushed back by the Mexicans, they might try to reclaim Texas for their own. I mean, so there's all kind of other stuff going on. We don't care about none of that because the word is spreading and we get this sense, okay, wait, it's over, it's over, it's over. So as it's spreading. So anyway, I just want to mention that because there's a lot of myth-making around Juneteenth. But as I was saying, when you think about rituals of social cohesion and you're reclaiming your time, the first reclamation of time that Juneteenth cele uh, celebrates is I'm reclaiming my labor time. There was no one reaction. And when you, when you read general order number three, and there were five general orders that were given that day. I won't go through all five, but I'll mention the trajectory of them. The first general order was the Union Army coming and saying, we in charge. The second order was like, okay, you Confederates, y'all need to line up. This is how y'all get back into the good graces. Y'all gotta come, confess your sins, take this over. The third one was, okay, you black people. And it's very short. They didn't read the Emancipation Proclamation. They said, y'all free and you should stay where you are and work for wages. Because one thing Grant and them were worried about, Sheridan and them was worried about, and then uh, Granger and them was worried about was Black people had been had flooded the Union Army. They had flooded into the Union Army camps. Remember, they happened way back east in South Carolina, and many of them had joined the Army. In fact, 
you know, Lincoln's pump. Well, anyway, let me in. They didn't let black people into the army formally until late in the war, which is why by the time you get to 1865 and then 1866 and then 1867, the army's getting blacker and blacker and blacker. Why? Because when you enlisted, you're enlisted for a term of years. The white soldiers are mustering out. The black soldiers have longer terms. That's when they formed the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th, 25th Regiment, the Buffalo Soldiers. That's a West story. And so these black soldiers, my, one of my former uh, students who's now um, a culture keeper in New York, who herself is from Dallas, Texas, the great Ava Wilson, um, Ava Wilson Kinsey, she wrote her uh, master's thesis on the black soldiers who are spreading the word of Juneteenth. So, you know, it's, it's one of the great ironies of Juneteenth is they given all this credit to a dude who wasn't even about that life. <laughs> so y'all y'all stop giving this credit to General Granger. He didn't announce nothing. There's no record of it anyway. So that haven't been said. They're reclaiming their labor time. But in that small general order is the, is the phrase, y'all stay where y'all are and work for wages and don't cause no problems. So then what you see is story after story after story of these enslavers begging black people not to leave and saying, I'll pay you. And black people saying, hmm. And there's a, there's the complete range. There's the complete range. If some of you Negroes is like, yep, I'm leaving. Where are you going? I'm not, I'm not here. I'm going not here. That's what I'm doing. There's a story that's <laughs> captured in one of these books where the son tells the mother, I love you. I'll never see you again. He just leaves. <laughs> he never said, I love you. I love y'all, but I got to go. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you got people who say, I'm staying. You paying? I'm staying. And they get those first wages. But the general order is one of the reasons why it wasn't as controversial as people might think is because it says in there, don't leave, work for wages. What the Union Army is trying to do is, is, is manage the chaos that's ensuing. This, this, is, this is a terrible thing. This whole thing been rebuilt like that. And in the middle of that, what are black people doing? Regardless of your politics or whether you stay, whether you go, what are they doing? I'm reclaiming my time. This is my time. This was my grandmother's time. This is my great grandmother's time. This is the African's time. Meaning what? I, we don't even know her name, but in the family story, we know that it all goes back to this sister who the story goes, she was out playing and then she got snatched. This is our time. We're reclaiming our time. Juneteenth, uh, Emancipation Day, all of the decoration that we're claiming our time. Now, what happens when that time you reclaim and like I said, go back and y'all go back and look at what we talked about before, because we went through the history of how this time builds over time, because the story of Juneteenth is not only the story of a celebration, the story of Juneteenth is really a celebration and self-determination. These two things are together. This is what Brewer said. You don't understand Juneteenth. You don't understand us. We're not just celebrating the end of enslavement. What we're celebrating is we have reclaimed our time, which means we now have the ability to be self-determining. So when you say Juneteenth, you're talking about uh, you're talking about celebration and scorching denouncement of injustice. At the Juneteenth celebrations, they always got somebody talking about, this is what happened, and now this is what we got to do. Voting rights, organize, build your stuff. They had a parade, they do their song, they're going to lift every voice and sing. After that becomes a thing. Before that, they have the spirituals they sing, and then they have the parade. At the beginning of the parade, you get the elders. Then you get the army the black troops. Then you get all the enslaved Africans who had come through. And then you, you go through and then you gather, you have a prayer sometimes, a lot of times, and then you have a talk about the thing we have to fight today. You have, when they have the lodges, Prince Hall, Masons, Order Eastern Star, they own their land. That's what Jack Yates and them did. They bought some property. So the story of Juneteenth is not just celebration, it's self-determination. It's about race pride and it's about unity. They're constantly talking about unity. The 1870s, 80s, 90s, Juneteenth, as we talked about, is kind of suspended between World War I and World War II, and then it comes roaring back in the 1930s. We talked about uh, Macheo Smith and what they did in Dallas at this, with the, the, the Negro Pavilion at the 100th anniversary of the, the founding of the Texas Criminal Enterprise. But it's also about memory and desire. So if you're reclaiming your time, and you've reclaimed your time, and Juneteenth then really takes off again beyond Texas and the South, places in the South, because of an ironic catalyst, a couple of ironic catalysts, 
1968, the Poor People's Campaign comes to here to Washington, D.C., Coretta Scott King on June 19th, 1968, the day after her 15th anniversary. And there's a recording of her giving this talk. She says, she's standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. She makes this in the speech. She said, I'm standing right here where my husband was. This is the day after our 15th anniversary. My husband was about boom, 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 boom. And the reason they do it on the 19th is to sync Juneteenth with this important ritual that they're doing to not only celebrate what they're doing, but to say, we are here gathered in DC to condemn this government and to make sure that the poor are taken care of. So Juneteenth is about activism. Juneteenth is about social protest. Now that, and then after that, all the people who are gathered in these places who haven't already taken Juneteenth back to where they're from, because the way, the way it spreads to Milwaukee, the way it spreads to Denver, the way it spreads to LA, the way it spreads to the East Coast, the way it spreads to places like Richmond, Virginia, often is because of migration patterns. Black people who celebrated in Texas and Oklahoma different places, when they move out there in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, they take it with them. But then after 68, and then when you sync that with the Black Power Movement, that's when you see Juneteenth take on all this other stuff. They almost always got African stuff. They got African clothes and drummers in Richmond, for example, Oliver Hill, who argued Brown versus Board of Education with his other lawyer friends. This guy is revered as an elder. They bring him out to the Juneteenth. The Elegba Society is in charge of Juneteenth in the 90s. When I would go to Juneteenth in Philadelphia, my man, Ron Brown, they, 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 we would have the, the, the drummers, you do libation. All that stuff gets synced up in the 1970s and 80s. And of course, Texas goes on, Miss Juneteenth, the Juneteenth parades, this kind of thing. But as you reclaimed your time, the first person to say, and we're gonna clear space in the social structure so that the time we reclaim, we ain't gonna get docked for it and pay. Brother Edwards. Edwards, who was a, a state legislator in Texas, introduces a bill 1979, it passes the legislature. We talked about that in 13 and 14. It becomes a state holiday in Texas. Is that because you want everybody to celebrate? Oh sure, y'all do what y'all want. But the time we reclaim, you ain't gonna dock my pay because I didn't come. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's coming from the governance structure. And then let's fast forward very quickly to where we are today. Holidays are rituals of social cohesion. Attempts to knit a social and cultural identity. Now these days, after what happened to uh, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, the fear. Oh my God, let's make, it a, let's make it a national holiday. What are you trying to do? Oh, this may be a simple equation for some of y'all. Adopt a holiday, avert a reckoning. <laughs> so in other words, if we can, if we, can we just throw Juneteenth in here? Okay, but you got a straight white nationalist in as the president. He ain't going for it. So here we are a year later, the reckoning seems to have been somewhat averted. Yeah, you toppled us temporarily from the presidency, but we're working on that because we got some new boogeyman we're throwing out there. 1619 CRT, what is it? No, we, know, we don't care what it is. We're trying to get back in power. So now here we are, the legislation has been signed. It's a holiday and now the fight will begin over how to maintain the time we reclaim. Because now everybody from the social structure gonna come in, some black people gonna come in with them trying to talk to both social structure and governance structure at the same time. And if you don't remember that Juneteenth was about black self-determination, that Juneteenth was not just celebrating emancipation, but more importantly, struggling, continuing to struggle for the full humanity that the symbolic and legal end of enslavement doesn't guarantee at all. Juneteenth, you could almost say Juneteenth, colon, the struggle continues. So if you're coming in now, uh, we all celebrate Juneteenth. And so I want some red soda and I want a slice of watermelon and that barbecue is very good. And how do you do that dance y'all do? Stop. <laughs> Do you know what this day is about? Yes, uh, in fact, I've been studying. And uh, 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 June 19th, 1865, General Gordon Granger, stop. So you don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, this was a day and then the slaves celebrated the slaves. See, you still talking crazy. And now everybody want to be in the Miss Juneteenth pageant. And now everybody want to give a speech. And now where's the voter registration table? Okay. 
where's the uh, where's the table for the donations to the building fund so we can finally retire the debt, the mortgage on this community center we're building? Wait, you don't have one? Okay, so this ain't no Juneteenth celebration. Yet. And, well, it's a federal holiday. Mm -hmm. And you know what we do on federal holidays that we created that y'all couldn't stop us from creating? That means that you can't dock my pay at the federal level when I take this day to do what I do, which is reclaim my time. And we get to decide that. You don't get to decide that. So those people, like, oh, I know, we have all we both heard it probably. This is the last thing I'll say. We both heard this. You know, they giving us this because uh -uh, somebody gave you Juneteenth. You freed yourself. You caused a crisis in this settler state. You weaponized that crisis to continue to advance. And this settler state has had to open up and accommodate your struggle because there's no way around it. If there had been a way around it, we wouldn't be in this conversation. We'd be somewhere in whatever came after the direct agricultural dimension of chattel enslavement. So Juneteenth is a day for you to remember and also to ask yourself, what are you doing? Not only to preserve that spirit, but to advance that struggle. Those two things come together. If you don't understand that, you don't understand Juneteenth. And as Jay Mason Brewer wrote in 1932, that means you don't you don't understand us. And on that note, happy Juneteenth, everybody. Happy <laughs> Juneteenth. Now celebrate Juneteenth. Don't get mad at nobody else. You can do it the way you want. Do whatever, but do, but do. But Make do. It. Yes. But do. In fact, uh, you know, it's funny. Then I'll just say this one last thing to the, our young people, to our children, to our children in particular. To everybody, but this is focused at children. If you've never sat with an elder in your family or in your community, let's take this day, Juneteenth. Let's carve this one out. Not 4th of July, not even Martin Luther King's birthday, which they're trying to turn into. We're going to, on this day, this is the day we're going to get you to paint the school that we already put in the budget for somebody else to do, but we're going to get you to volunteer and do it. Oh, y'all have messed up Dr. King's message. <laughs> Where's the money? Go listen to Karate Scott King on Juneteenth, 1968. But on Juneteenth, in order to preserve the spirit of Juneteenth and do what you just said, do, let us remember what was done on Juneteenth. Ask yourself, where do we come from? Ask your elders, young people, what do you remember? Ask your elders, what do you want to see? And then sit there and listen. You ain't got, don't argue with them. You can, that's plenty of time for that. You can do that on the 20th. You can do that on the 18th. In fact, the history of Juneteenth in Texas is so crazy. I should mention this because we didn't talk about this 13th or 14th either, but episode 13 and 14. They were so terrified in Texas, they meaning white nationalists, because in 1866, the first day, they, the first anniversary of, of, of General Order Number 3, they thought the black folk was going to turn up. And so in places like Houston, Galveston, and then eventually other places as well, of course. And the black press is a very important part of this because if you want to study this, all you got to do is go back into the history of the black press because it was the black institutions that preserved. They printed whole speeches and, and even the national black newspapers, the Defender in Chicago, the Courier out of Pittsburgh, the, the Amsterdam News, they published whole, just go back to, to June 13th, I'm sorry, June 19th. And any year that you see the black press, the local papers, you know, Michelle Smith had a paper in Dallas. I mean, you'll see all the Juneteenth stuff. So it's not hard to find. But they were so frightened at the possibility of what these Black people would do. They was like, maybe we shouldn't let them gather. And then the people in 1866 in Houston, you know, Galveston, they're like, you know what? Leave them people alone. Because, see, <laughs> you, you will be worse off if you mess with them, because remember, Texas is still under occupation in 66. The, the army is out there. Remember what I said, the army getting blacker. You, you just let them do what they do. And then as it became clear that these black people are not trying to fight y'all, they trying to build. They eased up off of Juneteenth. <laughs> and in fact, some white people, intelligent white people, started asking if they could come. Next thing you know, local white politicians start, can I come? Oh yeah, yeah, you can come. You can watch. Can I say a few words? What y'all think? Yeah. All right, keep it short. You can say a few words. I mean, so they, they began to realize, you know, integration isn't about you becoming somebody else. Integration is you're going to respect me. And if you want to come here 
Yeah, we give you a rib because you know we cooked the hell out that barbecue. We've been barbecuing for a week. I mean, Juneteenth don't start on the 19th. <laughs> you understand? Juneteenth done started weeks ago, man. These Negroes done slaughtered all kind of pigs and cows, whole beef, steer. They out in the in the country, then dug a fire pit. So you you can come get a rib, but you gonna you act like you got some home training. And that was so, so Juneteenth. <laughs> that's the that's the point. Yeah, young people go talk to your elders about that. And, and last week, um, on episode sixty six, you you in passing mentioned you know people not knowing how to talk to elders. Yes. And there was a comment uh, in in the comments on YouTube hmm. thank, thanking you because oh. this person said I never knew how to talk to an elder until you demonstrated, and it it floored me because I assume everybody's got home training that no. everybody has somebody in their life that said you know how to, you don't say what you say yes or you get your lips twisted off <laughs> you, don't speak to, you don't call elders by their first name oh, you, know, you don't call somebody you don't do that you know and even i you know <laughs> i had a situation with a police officer and i was with somebody and they took my license and they said karen and the person with me was like it's miss hunter how about that and he apologized yeah, you don't call. You don't know her. You don't know her. Yeah, you, it's not care. I don't let my students call me by my first name. How about that? And, and they don't to this day. I got students in their thirties, damn near forty years old. They will never call me by my first name. It's a respect thing. It's no and question. So I think maybe in this space too, there's an opportunity. What you just said, challenging or or asking young people to have that connection, but how? You know, and maybe we should spend just a moment. Just, you know, I, and I, you know, when we were growing up, they had mismanners and, you know, you, you had to know where to put the fork and, you know, uh, there were certain etiquette lessons that have been completely lost. And for black people, we have a different set of etiquette lessons. That's right. That have been completely lost because I see it in the way, you know, there would be no way you would curse around an elder. No. I see oh, it. no. You get, you wouldn't, you would not curse around an elder. You would not, you know, you pull up your pants, you erect yourself, take your hat off. There were just certain things that you- Or even get loud. Yeah, come on. As we, as we're talking about bonnets and pajamas, you know, there's a whole layer of- Profile, No question. Way in, ways in which we respect, not just our elders, but one another and ourselves that has been lost. And it's nothing to do with people telling you what to do or, you know, uh, no. following social whatever norms. It's no, who we are. We brought that with us on the boats. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we brought that with us on the boats. You respect an elder. In fact, the Egyptians would say, the ancient Egyptians, people of Kemet would say, you know, you bend your back to an elder, mm -hmm. meaning you bow. The Yoruba people, they call it dobale. You approach an elder, you don't approach an elder on your feet. If an elder is seated, you approach an elder on the ground. In fact, and I've done this myself. You go full prostrate. You no, know, you go down, your forehead touch the ground when you come up on a real elder. And many people know that. Now, there are different rules, but the, but, the, but the way of knowing underneath all those rules is these are elders. And in return, those elders as members of community must then nurture those younger, which is why in Juneteenth- I was just going to say, be elder worthy. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. the elder isn't just isn't just age no question in fact remember you man last year we were talking I forget which episode where i was walking down the street two years ago in summertime coming down georgia avenue and i heard this little girl say to this other little girl who was clearly a little bit younger than her but not much that's maybe a couple of years she said why are you talking to me like that i am your whole elder and i just started laughing because she was right <laughs> you know what I'm saying? elder isn't everybody over 65 if you're 14 and them and them young people that they done told you to look at, look after are six and seven years old, you're the elder in that protocol. Because the assumption is you've been here longer, therefore you are supposed to know something that's supposed to help the community. That's why children are giving other children to watch. It isn't just a matter of you know convenience or efficiency, it's also a matter of training. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when you substitute. When you, when, you, when you lose track of that, you've got problems. I mean, again, when I'm thinking about Miss Lula Bass, when she says this thing, right? When she says, you know, we had our own day, now everything is their day. What that means is there are things, one of the things it means is when you've reclaimed your time and your space, you preserve those things of your, in your culture that advance your group. That doesn't mean you don't interact with people. But what it means is you don't lose yourself 
and don't remember anything you did. I'll give you an example that maybe seems completely unrelated, but it's absolutely related. Uh, since we were together last week, the, uh, you know, Major League Baseball has announced that, you know, they're integrating the Negro. Well, they talked about this months ago. Howard Bryant been talking about it. And I agree with Howard on this, uh, as with many other things. They're integrating records from the Negro League into white Major League Baseball. And I'm saying white Major League Baseball for a reason. Because now they're saying, once we integrate these records, we can see how the Negro League's achievements stack up. No, because the Negro League records are incomplete, particularly during the 1930s, during the, uh, uh, the uh, Depression era and after. They don't have a complete record. So when you look now, they've integrated those records, and Josh Gibson has less than 200 home runs. Nah, you know what? Y'all do what y'all want. That's fine. You, but what we're not going to do is start using you as the point of reference for how we move in terms of protocol. If you don't know how to talk to an elder, trust me, there's somebody around you who does. And that doesn't mean that that's inflexible over time and space. Some things go too far. But for those of you who say, you know, I don't have to respect anybody. It doesn't respect me. And I think, of it, okay, slow down. It's probably somebody that hasn't spent a lot of time around elders. Because <laughs> people who haven't had a chance to be in community with elders, you know, it's a difficult thing because you haven't been able to sit and listen. And this is really, part of that training is about listening too. So yeah, I mean, and, and you, we've got people on the narrative team like Larry Crow and others. You know, I've seen Crow elicit answers. You know, Larry Crow is one of the great interviewers. He's one of the great ethnographers, what they would call ethnographer. I don't like that term, but I mean, you know, he, he, he talks to elders, he listens to elders. He's not gonna overburden a question. He's sitting with an elder doing an interview, capturing something, and he'll, you know, ask a very simple question and then back up. And be quiet that's what i teach <laughs> no see no, saying you, you're I, a master tell us about that just for no, a second i think mean, you gotta go but the, the power of the interview is in the silence wow. you know asking a question and being quiet people talk so much when you don't that is the power of a great interviewer mm -hmm. is to ask the right question and be quiet mm -hmm. so uh mm -hmm. on that note i appreciate you uh you. and i hope people spend this day in reflection of what they can do uh, to, to pass that baton, to be worthy of passing a baton, to know things that you can help the next generation. And then that generation, you know, and I get it, you know, these boomers. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm looking over there at Strauss's book now, William Strauss and Neil Howe, Generation, one book. And they'll be talking about boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, Everybody but, calm down. Because we, we can learn, we can learn from one another. Um, no question. And we had all that, we had all those categorizations long before those boats yeah. showed up. And, and, you know, I grew up in the era, children are to be seen and not heard. Oh, me too. <laughs> so, so you know what you did? You you sat and listened and learned a lot. Why we learned a lot? Because we couldn't participate. You don't get involved in grown folks talk, but you man, the stuff you learn. Stuff sit, you learn. Sitting and not being really visible. That's right. And everybody has a role. Juneteenth celebrations, traditional Juneteenth celebrations, you know, they had sporting events, they had foot races, they played baseball, they love baseball. They do it. And then they had the dance competitions, the dance off couples with dance, you know, did what they call the cakewalk, so many other things. What were the elders doing? Sitting under the tree. In other words, you bring them their plate, because guess what? Especially, can you imagine, Professor Hunter, being in the 1860s or 70s and 80s? These elders saw enslavement. Your whole job today is to sit. No, Grandma, you don't do nothing. <laughs> I'm going to win this race. But before I go over there, you got your red cake. You good? You got your, they love that red soda too. They would put lemonade and put red food color in it. Red pop is a big thing in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Angie Porter, you know, our, our friend Angie Porter, the lawyer. She's from Rochester, Minnesota. Rochester, Minneapolis old school Juneteenth celebrations because that's the upper Mississippi. So they know all about red pop, the cake, all this, the red devil cake. The elder's job is to sit. And then after it's all been done, we all sitting around, you might you might get a chance to sit there and, li and listen to them talk to each other. That's when, you, like you said, that's when you learn everything. You don't even, you watch an elder talk to an elder and you be sitting there because sometimes they forget you there or they don't care. You know, you know, you know, Maxine, I remember when we was 15. Remember when we was around there? Now, your best bet now is to just shrink. Because what you about to hear now will tell you as a 15-year-old, oh, 
Because she's been an old lady your whole life until this moment right here after the sun's going down, y'all sitting under the tree. And she started talking. Wow. I would never have gotten that if I asked her. She's with her friend. And right now, they 15 years old and 90 years old. <laughs> so let me just be quiet. <laughs> Very important. I love it. I love you too. That yes. And I love you. Love you too. Yes. yes. See, you. See you next week in the, yes, in the narrative streets. Yes, ma'am. In the